Hey, Decide Your Destiny crew. Thanks for joining me for another video. It's the Decide Your Destiny podcast, and we've got Frank King sitting with us today. Uh, he is from your TEDxCoach.com and the mental health comedian.com, and he has a lit litany of other things that he's involved in. Um, and I really want to just sit down with him and, and, and yeah, learn a little bit more about him. He's a very interesting character and discover a bit about his story. So, why don't you take it away, Frank? I told my first joke in the fourth grade. Oh, everybody, including the teacher, laughed. The, the teacher laughed hysterically. And I thought to myself, I'm going to be a comedian in 12th oh. grade. Because over here in the US, we have 12 public yep. school years. Yeah, yeah. 12th grade, last semester, they had a talent show. Uh, nobody had ever done stand up before. And it was 1975. And I did stand up and I won the talent show. Well done. And I went home and I said to my, um, said to my mother, I'm going to be a comedian. She goes, you're going to college first. I don't care what you do when you get done, but you can be a goat herder when you get done, but you're going to be a goat herder with a college degree. <laughs> so I, love I went to college. I got a couple of degrees, UNC, in University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and then moved with my first wife, who was my high school college girlfriend. We moved to San Diego, and just by chance, San Diego has a branch of the comedy store, the world-famous comedy store on Sunset in L.A., yeah. And they had an open mic night and I went to open mic night. And here's what I tell people who are thinking about doing comedy, go to an open mic night a couple of times, see how bad everybody else is. Uh -huh, They'll give yeah. you the courage to get up. So I went twice and they were horrible. So yeah. I got up on the third go and halfway through my set, I thought to myself, I'm home. I'm going to do this for a living. I yeah. have no idea how <laughs> but yeah. I'm going to, yeah. If I'd known how hard it was, Kyle, I probably never would have done it, but yeah. A year, a year and eight months later, the day after Christmas, 85, 1985, uh, I had asked my girlfriend, now my second wife of 33 years, I said to her, I'm going on the road to be a professional stand-up comedian. Do you want to come along? Thinking she'd go, oh, hell no. And she goes, yes. So she and I were on the road doing stand-up comedy. She just came fun. along with the ride. 2,629 nights in a row nonstop. Wow. Seven, seven years and change and, and worked with Seinfeld, Dennis Miller, Jeff Foxworthy, Ellen DeGeneres, Rosie wow. O'Donnell, Adam Sandler. Um, what's the guy's name? Who's the King of Queens, Kevin James, you know, just back when they were all just stand up comics working the road wow. and opened up for the beach boys for Neil Sedaka, uh, Mary Wilson, Lou Rawls. Cause oftentimes they'll have a comic open for a singing act. Yep. And so, uh, Came off the road in early 93, went to work at a radio station. They were hiring comics in the U.S. back then to be co-hosts on morning shows. And okay. I took a number one morning show and drove it to number six in 18 months. Uh, Hold on. Which means, which means I didn't just drive it in the ground. I drove it in the middle earth. <laughs> and I quit doing that. But I got fired. There, there's a th saying in the U.S. There's two kinds of people in radio: people who've been fired, people who are going to be fired. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So I started doing corporate comedy, which is the after dinner, after lunch, no association banquet kind of stuff. And they call it, over here they call it the rubber chicken circuit because they almost always serve chicken. It's always rubbery. <laughs> uh, I did that and made really good money for till 2007 or eight when the U.S. said the you know when the when the, yeah. when the U.S. helpfully crashed the world economy. Yes. And thank you, Goldman Sachs. And <laughs> Shut uh, up. yeah, that's that's when um, we the speaking business dropped off 80 percent. I mean, gone. And we lost everything that we had ever worked for in a bankruptcy. And that's when I learned what the barrel of my gun tasted like. Literally, um, I didn't pull the trigger. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Uh, and ironically, it was the beginning, sort of the end of my career as a funny speaker and the beginning of my career as a speaker who was funny because yeah. I always wanted to be a speaker and teach people something, but I had no idea what could I teach people. Yeah. And after I came that close and I looked at my family history of depression, it's called generational depression and suicide. My grandmother died by suicide. My mother found her. My great aunt died by suicide. My mother and I found her. I was four years old. I screamed for days. Oh and if, if you want to know the details, I'll spare you because I don't want to trigger anybody on the podcast, but because it's, it's like horror movie horrible. 
Yeah. Uh, it's in my first first of five TEDx talks called A Matter of Laugh or Death, Laugh or Death. Yeah. Anyway, uh, after that happened, after I looked at my family history, I thought to myself, you know, I could speak on suicide prevention. Beautiful. So I got a bunch of training, took several courses on suicide prevention. And that's what I do now is I come in, I tell my, my, my lived experience, my story. And then I teach people how to spot the signs of depression, thoughts of suicide, what to do, what to say. Because oftentimes you'll hear people say, so-and-so died by suicide. He never gave any hints. You know, there's never any indication. Well, there probably were hints and indication because nine out of 10 people who are suicidal, nine out of 10 give hints in the last week leading up to an attempt. And mm -hmm. so if you know what to That's look and listen not. for, yeah, if you know what to look and listen for, and you know what to do and say when you hear something that's dangerous, you can save a life. Because it doesn't take, you know, don't, you don't have to be a clinician to save somebody from suicide. Just yeah. listening, watching, and inner, you know, and, and 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 getting involved can save a life. So and, and, that's what that's that's what I do now when people actually get together live. <laughs> I, I go and I go and speak on that. Actually, um, I am speaking on Wednesday on Zoom. Cool. To Verizon all over the world. Where can people uh, see it? Uh, they can't. It's an internal. Uh, okay. You know, it's going. The Verizon Corporation hired me to talk about su suicide prevention. Well, you know what it is. They've got all these. Uh, they've got all these employees who are social distancing, yeah. and so I've got a. I've got a keynote called "Social Distancing and Staying Sane." Don't worry so much about your mentally ill friends. And what I'm doing is I'm talking about suicide prevention, signs and symptoms. I'm also talking about how do you survive a pandemic and social distancing. And I discovered early on, Kyle, back in March or April, that as someone with mental illness, and I have two, I am well prepared for a pandemic because if you have mental illness, you wake up in an uncertain world every day. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be high functioning, you need to, you know, medication, therapy, you need a self-care plan. Need a routine, so I'm teaching neurotypical people how to create a self care plan like a mentally ill person would. Yeah, and for some, for some of them, it's a revelation. It's they just they're they're floored because here's here's my worry, Kyle. We have all these people around the world who are neurotypical, neuronormal, you know, nothing mentally going on, and because of the situation, the pandemic, and the social mm -hmm. distancing, they are situationally depressed. Yeah. And they may not even recognize what it is, because if you've never been depressed, how would you know what it looks and feels like? I, I, I imagine in my head, people all over the country right this minute, all over the world, thinking, how come I can't get out of bed? Mm. I, I mean, I, I just don't want to get up. I want to pull the covers over my head and watch the second season of The Mandalorian on Disney+. Plus. <laughs> so, Is that a favorite of yours? So, yes, I, I binge watch both seasons. Um, <laughs> That that and the Queen's Gambit on Ooh. Netflix was just amazing. Okay, good, uh, good to know. Yeah, you know, yeah. If you haven't seen the Queen's Gambit on Netflix yet, I man, I'm telling you, do yourself a favor and and because I, I thought you know it's about chess. How good could it be? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> amazing. Uh, anyway, yep. So anyway, so I've done podcast after podcast after podcast, teaching neuronormal people how to use techniques that people with mental illness use every day to get out of bed, put one foot in front of the other. And it, we talked about this off the air. It, it, a lot of it involves a routine. Go to bed, mm -hmm. same time, get up, same time. You know, Because your routine, most people, at this point in time, what would be their ordinary routine is just blown out of the water because they're not commuting to work. You know, they're not in the office. They're home. Yeah. The spouse is home. The kids are home. It could be three generations of grandparents are home. You know, it's just, yeah. a, it's just a, it's like they used to say, a fruit basket turnover or a, so anyway, yes. that's what, uh, and that's what, that's what I'll do for Verizon is we'll talk about suicide prevention. Then we'll talk right. about techniques to survive the, and, and again, how to spot the signs and symptoms of depression. And one, you can actually spot on this format zoom, mm -hmm. because one of the signs of depression is letting your personal hygiene go. So mm -hmm. if you and I were just chatting, Kyle, just on zoom for whatever reason, and you know, this morning. Yeah, Frank hadn't shaved. He's still wearing his pajamas. What's he doing in bed at this hour? So letting your personal hygiene go 
because what happens is people, you know, they have difficulty getting out of bed, which means getting in the shower, which means running a load of wash. So the hair is a little dirtier than usual. They may not have shaved. Their clothes aren't quite as clean. That's a big, that's a big um, telltale symptom of thoughts of, you know, depression. Does it all so come back to you your get, self-respect? Like, so, you know, as you're getting more depressed, your self-respect kind of goes down, feel at the same time? No, no it's just a matter yeah. of mentally you just can't get out of, you know, you can't face Islam. the world. It's, yeah. yeah. You're, just, it, you're just overwhelmed by whatever the circumstances are in the world. Whether it's yeah. you have, you know, too much to do or you've lost your job and you have nothing to do. You know, why yeah. bother getting out of bed? Why? And I saw an article yeah. in the New York Times this week that said a goodly number of people, and I've got a friend like this, who some mornings, he's not a big fan of his job. It's difficult yeah. on a good day for him to get up and work. And he's been working from home eight, nine, was almost 10 months. Hmm. He said, some days, you know, I just grab the laptop, crawl back in bed, and I work from the bed. So it's kind of, you know, I can't get out of bed. Well, let me get my laptop and you know, I, yeah. I can, and I, f I find it comforting actually to work from the bed. Yeah. Um, so, cause you get the best of both worlds. You, you, didn't, you didn't, didn't have to drag yourself out of bed and you're working. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's, that's what I've been and doing. And you want to find what works for you. That's the thing. Like, I think, you know, there's, yeah. there shouldn't be a, a rule for everyone or, or, a, or a one tablet to fix all. I think, you know, each, each of us are so unique and so individual, yeah. you know, you got to find out what works for you to get you up and going you know yeah because the um the my my five part self-care plan again i've been teaching this to people all over the planet in the last 10 months by way of podcast is a diet i'm on the keto diet and i do intermittent fasting i usually have at least 20 hours between meals right um sometimes Good longer stuff. diet exercise i got an old nordic track i got some stretchy bands so i can exercise at home i walk the dogs first thing in the morning and then the first half of it is practically all uphill uh so diet exercise good night sleep sleep's yeah. restorative um meditation i meditate twice a day following mm. a meal and then medication if it's indicated mm. and that's another thing i find with neuronormal you know normal people is they're terrified of antidepressants because they feel like it's going to be a life sentence and i'm like no you can you can start you can start the antidepressants and then when the world returns to near normal you can taper off you're not you know, it's not a life sentence. You're not going to be doing this the rest of your days. Hmm. So, you know, you have to, I'm sort of myth busting on mental health, mental illness. You probably heard this. Well, here's the thing. Like people say to me uh, after somebody dies by suicide, why did he want to kill himself? Okay. That's a myth. Chances are in most cases, whoever it was did not want to kill themselves. They simply wanted to end the pain because suicide's <laughs> all about pain. So sad, and for people who are not, I'm used to my cycle. I have a three day cycle. If I start spiraling, I know I'm going down the first day. I'm going to flatten out the second, come back up the third. So because I've had that happen so many times, I can see day four. Hmm. I know on day four, things will be relatively normal. But if you're not used to a cycle like that, if, if depression is new for you, People in that situation generally live in the immediate and their thought process is it's never going to be any better than it is right this minute. They can't see day four. So that's a very dangerous state of mind because if they think it's never going to get any better, there's a good chance they may attempt mm -hmm. because they want to end the pain. So again, I'm myth busting for people. Uh, both There's nothing to pull them Ill. forward out of their no. current situation. Because they can't see past the moment. Yeah. They can't see how life would be any better than at this very moment. And if it's going to be this bad all the time, I'm done. But like I said, I've been doing this. I'm 64 years old. So I've been through, you know, who knows how many cycles. Because that's what major depressive disorder is. It lasts anywhere, anywhere from three days to two weeks. Mine happens to be a three-day cycle. And it recurs like a flat spot on a wheel. It just comes around every so often. Because in my case... Where it's not situational. I've been most depressed and suicidal at some of the best times in my life, which mm. is counterintuitive, but it, it's because it's a cycle. Yeah. I've been upbeat and happy at some of the worst times in my life. <laughs> because yeah. again, it's a cycle. It's nothing to do now. Now, a situation like my bankruptcy can trigger it, but generally it's 
it's not situational. So it's like again, a, an overwhelming you, feeling you get that kind of will poke its head up at a you know at, at an unannounced time. You get you start to get that feeling that kind of overwhelms you. Is that is that what it is? Well, not so much overwhelmed for me is I've described it this way in my keynote. It's like somebody is turning up the force of gravity, wow. making it more and more difficult to put one foot in front of the other. Mm. There's these mm. old diving suits, the ones with a like a, a globe shaped helmet they used to pump air down to. On, and, yeah. and because they're pumping air down to the suit, you have to wear lead filled boots to stay on the bottom. Gotcha. And so my depression is like, it's like strapping on those lead filled boots and it's really hard to put one foot in front of the other. Mm. But I know, that within three days, about the second day I kind of bottom out, third day I can feel them turning down the force of gravity. Yeah. And by the day, day four when I wake up, generally I'm you know back to level. But if you're not used to that, if you haven't experienced that or haven't taken note of that, then you just assume it's going to be this bad forever and that's really dangerous. Yeah. So, that, so does could, could comedy play a pivotal role in your life to balance balance it out or to like to accompany i guess your like you know when when you go down into those three-day spirals does comedy help you or like pick you back up or does it shift your attitude or like does it help you at all no not really although i must tell you and a friend a friend of mine uh, my best friend from north carolina for decades would tell you yeah with with depression depression in men often presents as anger or ir- irritability. Yes. And yeah. he, he would tell you that I am the most creative and most funniest when I am pissed off. <laughs> and so I've written some really good material in that three day cycle mm. because I'm angry the entire time. And anger, you know, generates uh, something, it clicks something into my head. And I, I, yeah. I always see things from a funny perspective. But for some reason, in that state of mind, I'm actually even funnier yeah well it's an um, artistic expression isn't it like you, you hear a lot of artists that were going through a lot of struggles sometimes they're on drugs sometimes they were going through lots of pain sometimes they're going through lots of grief and they created the most you know amazing paintings sympathy symphonies um you know whatever it is documentary yeah. because they were feeling that they were a bit deeper well and i did my third tedx talk was called mental with benefits the evolutionary advantages of mental illness because yeah. I I looked around and everybody that I knew who had a mental illness who wasn't completely dysfunctional also had some sort of amazing ability. They were yes. great musicians, writers, comics, magicians, politicians, athletes. And in, in my TEDx, yeah. I say, I think that I'm not broken. I was made this way and my... My depression and thoughts of suicide, simply the flip side of my imagination, creativity, comic ability, comic timing. It's all part of one package. Mm-hmm. And like you said, there are a lot of tortured souls who have created a great deal of fabulous art in one form or another. The, the trick is, again, is the realization that this is who you are and this is why you are this way. And you have to have a balance and I think when, when an artist, a comedian or magician or singer or whatever dies by suicide who has mental illness, it's somehow gotten out of balance, yeah. you know, and it's, it's leaned too far to the dark side yeah. and, and the pain is too much. I have my second mental illness is something called chronic suicidal ideation. And what that means simply mm-hmm. is that for me and people in my tribe, the option of suicide is always on the menu as a solution for problems large and small. And I say small. This is how my brain works. My car broke down a couple of years ago. I had three thoughts unbidden. Get it fixed, buy a new one, or I could just kill myself. Wow. Yeah. That's chronic suicidal ideation. Now, yeah. it's not really a serious thought of, I'm sure I could finance another car if I had to. Yeah. Um, but just that's just the way my brain works. But it's and an option. It's always an option. It's yeah. a coping mechanism. Gotcha. And the, um, the good news, the silver lining in that cloud is, every time I've spoken since 2014, there's been at least one person in the audience who has chronic suicidal ideation. Wow. They don't know it has a name. They think they're just some kind of freak and completely alone. I had a young woman come up to me after a college presentation. She goes, thanks for your keynote. I said, you're welcome. 
She goes, look, I tell you, it made me weep. How did it make you weep? She goes, well, you know your story about the car, get it fixed, buy a new and just kill yourself? She goes, I've been having those thoughts all my life. I thought it was just me. I didn't know it had a name. I thought I was some kind of freak all alone. And when I heard you say that out loud, I realized for the first time in my life that I'm not in fact alone and I wept. So that's part of the ROI for me, very therapeutic for me to help people like that. Maybe steer them just far enough off the path of suicide by letting them know that, that they'll live a normal life. So that's, and it's yeah. happened over and over. And sometimes more than one person in the audience has it. I did nope. a show for some dentists, dentists and their teams and a young woman came up because I told the story about at least one person in the audience has this. She comes up at the break. She goes, I'm your one person. I said, my one person, what? She goes, I'm your one person. I said, with chronic suicidal ideation. She goes, yeah, and I didn't know it had a name. Yeah. So, yeah, it's um, I think you know those those tears are tears of of joy and, and compassion and connection, aren't they? That that she expressed because yeah. she found she realized that she you know she's okay being who she is. She doesn't have to feel like the like the lonely alien on the planet Earth. You know that, which I think is what yeah. People, people with mental illness of a wide variety think yeah. they're the only one who's going through this. Yeah. And so to let them know, my fourth TED talk is called Suicide, the Secret of My Success. Dead man talking. And, and the premise was, I read a couple of studies on entrepreneurs. One third of entrepreneurs are depressed and suicidal. Wow. And the clinicians determined it was because of long hours, little sleep, and unmet expectations. Well, I think that's true in a lot of cases. However, being an entrepreneur, I believe that some entrepreneurs are not depressed and suicidal because they are entrepreneurs. I think they are entrepreneurs mm. because they were depressed and suicidal. Okay, let's go back in time. I'm 23, 24 years old. I'm married to my first wife, who's a wonderful woman. We didn't belong together. I'm selling insurance, which is a great business, but I hated it with a passion. And I realized, and I was not pursuing comedy because she did not want me to be a comedian. And I realized, you know what? I'm suicidal. If I don't change something, I'm going to kill myself sooner rather than later. My second thought was, well, wait a minute. Couldn't I just divorce my wife, quit my job, try comedy? If it works, great. If it doesn't, well, I can still kill myself. And again, I thought I was the only person who ever had that train of thought. And I've met at least a half a dozen people, comedians, entrepreneurs, and others who had the very same thought process. They were living a life that they didn't think they belonged in with people they didn't think they belonged with, doing what they didn't think they should be doing. And they thought to themselves, you know, I'm gonna kill myself. And then, because a friend of mine, a comedian, told, was telling me the story of how she got into comedy. Mm. And she got to that part right there where she goes, and then, I said, let me finish this for you. And then you thought I could quit my job, try comedy. If it works great, if it doesn't, I could still kill myself. She goes, how do you know that? I go, no, honey, I lived it. Yeah. But again, as I was living through it, I thought I'm the only person on the planet who this is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's right. yeah. Divorce my wife, quit my job, try comedy. What, 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 what? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there, there's, um, there's 7 billion people on the earth and, and a lot of the pains and stuff struggles and different sort of things there's going to be whole colonies you know that 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 feel or have gone through certain pains and yeah no one has your story we all have unique stories but there's going to be like you said before your tribe you know your tribe that knows about yeah. you and, and work with and, that tribe and oftentimes the tribe members don't know they're in the tribe until i come in and i tell them about my car get it fixed mine or kill myself they're like what that has a name really <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's a uh, it's 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 one of the things, Kyle, that gets me out of bed in the morning. It's one of the things that keeps me from killing myself because I realized after all these people came up, you know, time and time again. Yeah. Uh, I began to feel like there's a character named George Bailey in a movie called It's a Wonderful Life, and the angel shows him what Bedford Falls, a little town, would be like if he'd never been born because he wishes he'd never been born. Mm -hmm. So in my case. I've seen what other people's lives might be like if I were not there to mm. say to them, no, no, it's a thing. It's got a name. You're not alone. Yeah. Because if I kill myself, I realize I would take all those people with me who never got a chance to hear me speak and, yeah. and you know, and, and, and reassure them that you're not a freak. 
it's a thing. Yeah. So yeah. I, now I'm stuck. Now I can't kill myself, Kyle. <laughs> They've got you catch 22, mate. They got you cornered against the wall. Yeah. Now, something a lot of people don't realize is with chronic suicidal ideation means I'm willing to pull the trigger anytime, which sounds like a bad thing. But in fact, because I believe suicide is all about pain and I, I'm willing and able to pull the trigger anytime and in the pain, I can stand a great deal of pain knowing I have a way out. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 A friend of mine said to me, if it weren't for Gets my chronic through. suicidal ideation, I would have killed myself a long time ago. But knowing yeah. I've got an out allows me to go through a great deal of pain and discomfort knowing that I could end it at any moment if I chose to. Yes. So, yeah, there's I a parallel experiment they did in the U S with morphine. Yes. Um, used to, if you were in a great deal of pain, let's say with cancer, they would come in every four hours and give you a shot of morphine, but they wouldn't do it in less than four hours because they were afraid it would suppress your breathing and kill you. And somebody got the bright idea. Let's give the patient control over the morphine, give them a button. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that the patients ended up using less morphine mm -hmm. because they were in control. Mm -hmm. They would sit there and think, this is really painful, but I think I can go another 15 minutes. I can go another 15 minutes. I can go another 15 minutes. So yeah. because they had the control of the button, yeah. they, and in Oregon, we have something called death with dignity or right to die. They find that people actually live longer and better with a terminal illness, if you give them that option, if you give them a way out, they tend to live longer and have a better quality of life knowing that when time comes, they can go to the pharmacist, pick up the cocktail and check out that's on their own schedule. So it's, that's like, it's kind of a parallel. Euthanasia. That's uh, like the like euthanasia. Yes. Yeah, and in Oregon, you can do it for yourself. And they yep. found that because, because you're giving somebody who is really concerned about loss of dignity and such with a terminal illness. When you give them control after a psychiatrist has signed off and a doctor signed off and you've constructed a cocktail that they live longer and better lives knowing that when the time comes, when they're ready when they feel they're sliding and about to lose, you know, whatever that they can check out. So mm -hmm. it's, it's an odd, it's kind of an odd ironic because I can kill myself at any time I stay alive. What? Hmm. Yeah, it's, it kind of relates to, you, you think about, um, I guess, children and kind of, you know, when they're screaming and clamoring for something and you give it to them and then they, they don't want it anymore. They go, well, you know, <laughs> the whole point was for me to scream and clamor about it, but now, I don't, now I'm not yeah. really interested. Oh, no, I got it. So, yeah, so it's, um, it's, and there are eight or nine states in the United States where you have this option. Wow. Um, people, come to, people come to Oregon, uh, yeah. move here for the option because they're, they're terrified that they, their end is going to be terribly painful, loss of dignity, mm. you know, loss of mobility, uh, end up on a ventilator if you can find one in the U.S. now. <laughs> I mean, in yeah. Los Angeles, one out of four people apparently have COVID and they've, they've you know, they've run out of ventilators. They, they're telling ambulance drivers, look, if, the, if you don't think they, the person's going to make it, don't bring them to the hospital because we got no room for them. We need to, we need to, we need to save people we can save so they're rationing medical care, dear God. Yeah. Depressing. Yes. Yes. But on the brighter side, oh, which, yeah. you know, my mother would say on that happy note. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Look, mate, you, you, you're still smiling and, and you're still inspiring people. And I think, you know, the fact that your biggest purpose and driving point is to save lives. And like you said, you know, if you, if you, if you went away, you'd be robbing pretty much robbing other people of their lives, you know, because yep. you've got this great story to tell and this great message to share and breathe new life into people. And Kyle, it's, um, it's unusual for a male to open up about things that are, you know, emotional, emotional health, mental health. It's called toxic masculinity. It's really bad where yes. I'm from in the South, the Southern United States, right. we're yeah. taught, we're taught as Southern males big boys don't cry. So to see me on stage, telling my story, being vulnerable, shedding a tear while I'm telling it, it's, you know, it's uh, Brene Brown, the author says vulnerability mm. is a superpower. It, people are attracted by vulnerability. Yeah. And so that's, that really is what I do. My clients will tell you, look, Frank, 
we just brought you in here to start the conversation on suicide because what they discovered, what I discovered when I was putting together my first TED talk, Kyle was, even though one person in the US dies of suicide every 11 minutes, hardly anybody talks about it unless you bring it up and then everybody's got a story. Yeah. Yeah. And so if I can come in and start the conversation, it gives other people permission to give voice to their feelings and experiences without recrimination. I started the mm. conversation. I give them cover yes. to come out. So far. Yeah. And and they and they uh, I did a thing in in January of last year in Iowa at a big manufacturing plant, did two keynotes, two shifts, and mostly men, 95% men. And I talked to the meeting planner in June. Just we had a conversation. I need. I, I was going to get a video, and it never arrived. And so I called her. Mm. And she goes, Frank, I'll send you the video. And by the way, I want you to know this. After you left, you have no idea the impact. We had grown men coming into the nurses. They have two nurses on staff. The nurses' office, and and shared with the nurses that they were having mental health struggles, similar to that guy that came in and spoke. Mm. Wow. And, and they had never made any indication in that fashion about those things before i arrived yeah so that's that's the power of starting the conversation yes yeah exactly i made a video today with, with a friend of mine um who's running for a local polit uh, political party and we, we did we had that conversation of um you know talking about the importance of conversation and, and and how you know people need to talk and need to communicate and how how you know i guess slamming them down or um or, or cutting them off is is so destructive and, and i was speaking to a, a friend of mine last week at, at, at a local pub and chatting to him and he had some interesting ideas and beliefs and i said oh wow cool like let's adventure down this because i'm a very curious person you know so i'm like tell me tell me like you know like you know if that idea links to this and your belief and how does this all work and he he straight away went like like a shell went inward and went Oh no! Yeah, I, I, I don't want to share anymore. And I said, "Why?" He said, "Look, I just don't know how people are going to react. It's a very polarizing yep. world. I'm very worried about what people might say if I have a belief, you know." And I went, I, I inquired. I said, "What do you mean? Like, you, you know, I'm more than happy to talk to you." And he said, "Look, you know, I've been seeing a lot of people post up on Facebook. A lot of my friends saying, if you believe this, you know, unfollow me. If you believe this, unfriend me.'" Mm -hmm. And I just, yep. and I, I hadn't heard this, you know. I don't know. Maybe I'm out of the. Oh, yeah. Out of the new, you know, I hadn't heard much about this. I mean, like, are we serious right now that we're, 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 we're behaving in this sort of way where your belief could change from today to, and to tomorrow, but you're just going to neglect and segregate yourself from someone else because they have a different belief? Like, what's been lost, I think, Kyle, that was actually a thing when I was young was the ability to agree to disagree. Yes. Yeah. I don't think people can do that anymore. No. On both I, sides. I, I, yes, on both sides. But I think it's um, so I don't want to lose a friend. So I don't want to get into a, a Twitter war or a Facebook fight because yeah. people are dug in. I mean, they they firmly believe what they firmly believe, especially about politics or religion or, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah as long as you can have, have communicate and can, can conversate, you know. Yeah. About, in the real world. In the real world. Yeah. Yeah. About other things. And in the real world, stay, you know, not on Facebook where, you know, I'm not a big fan of, of text, email, Facebook, because, you know, you lose a lot of context in a text or in an email. You can't hear the person's voice. You can't see their face, their expressions. You know, it's just a flame throwing back and forth. <laughs> That's a, it's a pretty good way to explain Twitter. Or, and I, uh, I have no, you know, I, I just, yeah, I it's mean, too bad. Yeah, it is like you you want to have the, the the open source conversations and kind of come to some sort of agreement. And, and if you disagree at the end of the day, then you know you can disagree, but you can maybe communicate about something else or you know be productive with 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 with, with a different part of your relationship. You know, it doesn't yeah, have to be a, embodied by that one topic. Making people's lives better quickly. Hmm. You know, if they yeah. can get making people happy. Yeah, and then they get where people are not having to social distance, and I think if they can do that and do that quickly and mm -hmm. provide support for the population who are out of work and so forth, that they may we may have a shot at going. Look, we're good at this. You know, ask yourself 
This is what the question that Americans always ask themselves when an election comes up. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? And if the answer is yes, I think we got a shot. If the answer is no, I think we're in trouble. So the um, employment is such a big part of, you know, a, a country's happiness and trust in, in their government, you know, the economic situation. People complain about spending that money, you know, the federal government going into debt. But if you give people 600 bucks a week, they're going to pump that right back into the economy. Mm. They're going to pay rent. They're going to buy food. They're going to, you know, I mean, so it's, it's, Again, there is slogan. an upside. Yeah. Uh, let me give Australia some credit, by the way. Uh, I mean, because I mentioned you guys all the time when I talk. Yeah. yeah. Eight out of 10 people in the U.S. are dying of suicide right now are men. Men age 45, 54, because of that male that toxic masculinity, big boys don't cry, they don't share their thoughts, feelings. In Australia, they created something called the Shed Project, I believe. Hmm. Shed in Australia is what a garage is in the US, you know, the attached to your yeah. house. And they discovered, I guess years ago, that if you put two men in a garage with their heads underneath the hood of a car, not looking each other in the eye, they can talk about anything. I mean, things that matter. You know, mm. Hey, Bob, I'm depressed. Really? You're depressed? Hand me a wrench. Um, and so <laughs> that movement became the Shed Project. And whether it's working on a car or woodworking or ironworking or f fishing, for goodness sakes, um, as long as the men aren't looking each other in the eye, they can talk about it. And it spread to Europe. And there's now a Shed movement in the U.S., and it gave birth to something called the barbershop movement for African-Americans in the United States since the time of Jim Crow, you know, the um, segregation and whatever. Yep. Barbershops have always been a safe space for African-American men. Yep. And so they're training barbers in mental health first aid. Good. And men are having conversations with their barbers like the men do under the hood of a car in the shed project. Yeah. So that's how we begin to put a dent in that eight out of 10 suicides are men. We yes. get them talking to one another about real things and real problems and real solutions. And you guys started that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, you know, we, we definitely, we definitely had the same problem as you, like, you know, big boys don't talk and are definitely going through schooling and that whole system. Like it, there's definitely that, that male rah, rah and, you know, mm -hmm. being your man, you, you definitely experience experience that very much the same over here. And during the um, pandemic, uh, I think one of the biggest killers was mental health and 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 the the numbers. You know, the that our a lot of you know a lot of our resources, a lot of the companies were getting the phone calls they were getting, the stories they were getting, they were just getting slammed during this period of time. Um, and that was probably our like, you know, when you look at the deaths from COVID here, it was definitely like mental health was definitely really taking the numbers. And I think a lot of these organizations really pushed their messages out, really pushed their, their projects out, really tried to get out to people. And there were lots of, you know, lots of initiatives. Um, or I could see it all over social media, um, you know, like kill, like kill the stigma, um, you know, like mm -hmm. the stigma, a lot of these initiatives that were really great. And, out of this, you know, uh, especially in Melbourne, Victoria, um, I'm, I'm part of a few online uh, like Facebook groups and a lot of these you know, like Victorian brotherhoods and a lot of these different groups came out because of the mental health massive decline and suicide rate spiking during the lockdowns and just needing a resource and men not knowing where to go. And so they created these Facebook groups, created these online communities and they would talk multiple times a night, um, you know, uh, like so a week, you know, at night for hours at time and all these groups and this big move, I noticed that in Australia, like this big movement for men's mental health really took, took, took charge because of, like you said, you know, um, the eight out of 10, I think something that goes unhidden in Australia and New Zealand is the, the rates of suicide. Like, it's mm -hmm. not, you know, it's actually pretty staggering numbers, you know, and this whole situation spiked that and, and, you know, we needed men to kind of band together and Victorian brotherhoods and people to kind of get rid of the stigma and it's okay to, you know, express yourself and have a cry and yeah. talk, you know. And I think, I think I'm really, really happy with what, how Australia has responded, you know, beyond blue, a lot of these organizations have responded. Mm -hmm. Well, and part of the problem for men is 
is that they tend to identify closely with their job. So if they're out of a job, the question arises in their mind, well, if I'm not that guy, who am I? Yeah, the self-worth. Yeah. Yeah. And part of the problem in the U.S. is we've lost a lot of manufacturing jobs. Now, people think they all went to China, but that's not true. Only about 15% went overseas. The other 85% of those manufacturing jobs went to AI and robotics. Hmm. So you got a guy who went to high school, you know, a blue collar guy, and he worked his way up to shop steward in a manufacturing plant, good middle class wages. And then at age 52 or three, tossed out, you know, kicked to the curb. Hmm. And that was his identity. Yeah. So if that if I'm not that guy, who am I? Yeah, that was happening with the truckies over here. Um, you know, get say, hey, you've got probably one more year, you know, a couple more years, like for the truck drivers. You know, like this company's looking at different ways that it can, you know, bring AI technology into, mm-hmm. you know, take you take a job. And you know, yeah, if 55, 65, been doing this your whole life. You know. Yep. And. I know I've I've got mates that are that are you know like in their fifties and they they've got friends in the situation and the friends drinking doesn't know what to do just losing mm-hmm. it you know and I don't know I really think that should be part of a um, that, that, that's a missing link in, in in I think society and organization and government is you know who who picks up who picks up after that you know who picks up there's a big influx of um, you know technology that replaces big big portion of the population's job mm-hmm. who picks that up you know and you know and i think that's where i guess entrepreneurs have really filled the role you know entrepreneurs um you know business coaches i think this year i've seen you know more business coaches more yeah, go to know, link linkedin yeah. dear god everybody's a coach exactly everybody's a coach which which i guess kind of makes sense because it's probably the time where people need coaches in one way or another mm-hmm. you know more than ever i know i know i got made redundant from my my sale, my part-time sales job. And then I had to, you know, had a quiet month and was watching news and, you know, media. And I just had to shut it off because I just went, this is sending me into a, a spiral. I'm just staying, staying at home, just cooping, cooped up, like looking at all this stuff. And I went outside. I saw people, more people than ever walking the ground, people walking with dogs. I didn't realize we had so many dogs here. <laughs> you know, these dogs have been banished to the shadow realm, realm for years. And then all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> this thing hits and then people are walking their dogs more than ever. Um, and, you know, I just went, yeah, I, and then I hired, I hired a coach and, and that coach really helped me um, turn, turn my, my business around and, and become self-sufficient and, and, you know, double what I was earning when I was working part-time um, mm-hmm. for that sales job. So, you know, I think this year, yeah, and you, you you know you hope everyone's a good coach. You hope there's no charlatans, but obviously that's not how it works. But you know I think it's it's you know there's no surprise that there's so many coaches because it's you know how do I get out of the situation? You know who do I talk to? How do I get out? You know and I think people like you and what you do and the work you do is um, you know more important than ever. Yeah. Well, and I'm the other half of my business is coaching people to get TEDx talks. We talked about TEDx Melbourne. Yeah. And and I tell my speaker coaching, TEDx coaching clients, look, nobody's meeting live right now. Nobody's booking conferences, you know, to fly to wherever. Yeah. However, it's a good time to build. It's a good time to get yourself ready for when the COVID mm-hmm. eases up, they start booking live events again. Um, I'm guessing probably 25 or 30% of speakers from before have quit or retired because they just, you know, they drop yeah. by the wayside because there hasn't been any work. So the demand will be there, pent up demand, mm. but you need to be ready. So let's see if we can't get you a TEDx between now and then mm. to set yourself up to be ready to push hard for booking. So use yeah. the time to plant seeds. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, use the money from the federal government to subsidize your speaking business. Yes. Uh, yeah. Cause you know, when, when, what other time in the world, is the federal government going to send gig workers like me and you yeah. a check every week? It, yeah. It's first time in first time in the history of unemployment it's ever happened. Yeah. Exactly. So bank the money. Let's prepare for when the live engagements come back. Let's get set up. Make sure the website's good. Your social media, you know what I mean. So use the time to grow and build and plant seeds, and then we'll harvest when, yeah. you know, when the world returns to near normal. Yeah. And it's a beautiful goal to have 
going ahead, you know, beautiful, pulling you forward into the future and, and you know, keep, keeping, keeping that vision alive. Yeah. And again, you know, it looks like we're getting 300 a week right now in unemployment federal when I get another couple hundred from the state and then hopefully with the new administration, it'll get bumped up a bit. And so again, when <laughs> never in the history of unemployment has the government ever given gig workers like me and Uber drivers and whatever, you know, a check yeah. every week. What a great concept. So <laughs> let's use that time and money because you got time on your hand. You got money coming in. Let's use it wisely and prepare for when, because the world will at some point snap back and the, the demand for speakers and people will want to get together more than ever. Exactly. Because they've been isolated for, yeah. Because you know, a lot of these conferences I do, it's about the educational element. It's about the vendor showcase or the exhibit hall, but it's also about networking with people you only see once a year mm -hmm. at the meeting. So I'm sure this is going to snap back and, you know, people are going to want to get out and mingle and meet and network and yeah, just don't know when that's going to be. <laughs> yeah. And, I, you know, and by the way, I'm grateful yeah. over, over here in Perth because uh, you know, I think that's already, that's already kind of, well, it's already happened to be fair, mm -hmm. to be fair. It never really, one lucky thing about the city is that we're the most spread out city in the world. So, you know, mm -hmm. people don't congregate, you know, in groups as much, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and even when you go out, like cafes close at 2 PM, some, some close at one thirty. um, you go out for, for a meal and, you know, at a restaurant one night, there'll be a few people next night you'll be one, one of the only two people. So it's just, it's, it's more of a family city and it's, um, it's not very social, active, you know, tight knit places like Sydney and Melbourne where things are pumping, where all the restaurants are lined up in the same location. Yeah. So that has really, that has really been, um, I guess, a, a bit of luck for us. But yeah, I can tell you that, yeah, when people first started to be allowed back out, it was busier than ever. Yeah. So you're right. Yes. When you get the opportunity, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be clamming for the door. I, I hate to say there's a silver lining, but you know, if 25, 30, 40% of speakers who are speakers before, you know, before COVID, um, according to the national speakers association, they're going to fall by the wayside. They're going to retire. They're going to do something else because they can't survive. They, you know, 10 months, no live events, a lot, put a lot of speakers out of business. Hmm. So they will be, you know, when the world returns, there'll be probably just as many engagements and far fewer speakers. I've got a cousin who owns a restaurant and he's struggling, but he's getting by with takeout and so forth. And he had worked in New York City for his father-in-law at a restaurant called the Beach Cafe. And in the last recession, 2008, 9, 10, um, the Beach Cafe survived. A lot of restaurants didn't. And he said, Frank, the next two years, for the beach cafe were the best in their history because people still had to eat and there were 40 percent fewer restaurants so he said just hang on yeah it's coming back yeah hang on as tight as you can now, now here's the here's what a friend of mine said to me about that he said frank yeah hang on is a great idea it's good advice but listen think of that think about it this way let's say i ask you i want you to run 20 miles could you do it and i said well, yeah, I could not, not in record time, but I probably could pull it off. He said, you know why you could pull it off? He says, because there's a beginning, a middle and an end. He said, about mile 15, you're starting to think to yourself, oh man, I got five to go. I can do this. He said, but what if I said to you, Frank, like the pandemic run, how far am I going? I don't know. When can I stop? Don't know that either. I'm not going to be quite as enthusiastic about strapping on my Nikes and hitting the pavement because who knows when it's going to end? And the yeah. pandemic's like that. 9-11 took place on one day and we began to rebuild. The last recession in 8, 9, 10 lasted, you know, the, the, the crash lasted a week or so and we began to rebuild. I would say uh, I've got one question. I guess one question through the interview. Um, interesting sort of question, uh, especially, uh, you know, through, through, through the current climate of everything. But I wanted to ask you, what, what does decide your destiny mean to you? What do, what do those three words kind of mean to you? Someone's you know, deciding their destiny. Someone younger is watching this and wanting to begin on their journey. Now, what would those or, words mean? I would say young or any age. And yes, here's yeah, why. true, true. Yeah. I've got a client and his, uh, the title of his 
TEDx pitch, because you have to get a title and subtitle, yep. is in is a word individuation now. And I didn't know that there was such a word as individuation. Yep. But what in layman's terms is kind of like a midlife crisis, although it can happen anytime during your life. And the subtitle for individuation now is what if who you are isn't really who you are? You know, what if the destiny you're living is not the destiny you're supposed to be living? Yes. And the idea is, and it's happened to him. That's how he knows about this. Hmm. Happened to him at age 40. Um, he said, Frank, here's the deal. My mother wanted a son who was a banker. So I became a banker. My wife wanted to be married to a banker. Good income, you know, a standing in the community, somebody she could be proud of. However, when I, he was meeting with a coach, business coach, because he was trying to get to the next level at the bank. Hmm. And the business coach finally said to him, Anthony, you are well qualified for that next position. But the reason you're not getting it is, is because it's not what you're supposed to be doing, in hmm. my estimation. Hmm. You're not a banker. Hmm. And that's when he realized he was living something that was not his destiny. Hmm. Someone else. And so he quit, quit his banking job, went back to college, got a degree in psychology. Uh, and I will tell you, and he would tell you, there is collateral damage doing something. If you've been living up to everybody else's expectations and you stop doing that, mm -hmm. yeah. his wife left him because she wanted to be married to a banker with that kind of income. His mom never spoke to him again in life. Wow. Because she'd been proud of him as a banker, but she was not proud of him, you know, going back to college and getting a degree in psychology. But now he's happier than he's ever been with his third wife. <laughs> and and so I believe you, you know, and I told you early on. Yeah, and I told you early on in the conversation that I realized I was married to the wrong woman, doing the wrong job, and not pursuing what I believed I was born to do. Mm. My destiny, as it were. And I was gonna kill myself. And so I think people need to ask themselves, need to be given permission to ask themselves, is this, is who I am really who I am? You know, it, it, is this really where I belong hmm. or do I belong? So, because I think oftentimes people don't realize they have a choice. Yeah. And who am I pleasing? You know, yeah. Who am I pleasing? Is this really where I belong? Is who I am really who I am? Yeah. Bear in mind. If you decide it isn't, there's going to be some collateral damage if you jump. Mm. But um, long term, I've I've thought I often. I'm 64. Been doing stand up since I was about 25, <laughs> which is what I thought I should be doing. Yeah. And I look back and think to myself, what if I hadn't made that jump? Mm. What if I hadn't decided to divorce my wife, quit my job, and try comedy? And I'm now 64 and looking back, wishing I had. Talk about depressed. Oh, yeah. dear God. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think in life, you need to pick a lane, pick your, find your lane, pick your lane and, you know, and drive hard and fast. Drive, as they say in the United States, drive the car like you stole it. <laughs> so drive your life like you stole it would yeah. be my advice. And that's, that's what destiny looks like. Good. I believe you have to go deep and yes. decide if what you're doing is really, and okay, now here's the thing, Kyle. People would say to me, that's a great idea, but how do I pull it off? And I would say, well, let's say you determine that you really shouldn't be a banker. But you, you know, it's a good job in the United States. That's where your medical insurance comes from. Don't quit your job. Don't give up your day job as a say in comedy. Mm. But pick up, make what you think you'd like to be doing into a hobby or avocation. Try it part time. You know, road test this idea before you give up your day job. You know, in your spare time, part time, pursue whatever it is you think you might like to be doing. It's going back to school yep. or another particular a job or becoming a life coach or, be, you know, being an entrepreneur in some other fashion. Just hmm. give it a try while somebody's still paying the bills and covering your health insurance. Yeah. And then if it's what you should be doing, chances are over time, you'll come to a point where you think, you know what? I can make a living doing this. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's my advice. You know, don't, for God's sakes, don't give up. I tell, I tell aspiring comics and speakers all the time, don't give up your day job, for God's sakes. Um, yes, we're on, we're on an economic cap planet. You know, you, you, you can't, yeah. yeah. No, 
make make your day job the life support system for your dreams. Let yes. them pay the bills while you're pursuing what you think you should probably be pursuing and get prepared to make the jump. Love that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then you get the time, you get the room, you get the, you know, because you, you're dabbling in the two life directions. You're able to dabble. If I keep going here, am I going to be satisfied? If I risk it over here, am I going to be okay with the uncertainty? And you, you get to dabble and play with the two sides before you get to Yeah, because I've said oftentimes that speaking and doing stand-up comedy is a great part-time job. If you don't have to depend on it to pay the bills, feed yourself, and provide your health insurance here in the U.S., then it's a great gig because you're pursuing your passion. You're picking up a little extra money you can bank, you know, outside the salary or whatever you're making at work. And you can make that decision over time. Man, I love this speaking thing. I'm going to, I'm going to push hard. I'm going to, the day will come when I'll make, make this my living. Hmm. So that, yeah. that's my, that's, that's the action item is, you know, just keep your day job and, and try it on the side, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. No, I love that. Really appreciate that, Frank. Um, and I think, you know, it's quite inspirational to, to, towards the end. And I think, yeah, keep those conversations well, alive. Yeah. And I will tell you that I, I was in the insurance business as I was building my comedy business. Yeah. I didn't quit my insurance job until the day before Christmas in 1985. I went on the road as a full-time comic the day after Christmas 85. So I rode that job right up to the very end. Wow. And then made the jump. And and by the way, when I made the jump, I had 10 weeks of work booked in the new year. Yes. You know, to so I had money coming in the first, you know, I had two and a half months worth of income set up. And then when I worked my first week, I booked my week 11. And when I worked my second week, I booked week 12. So, you know, uh, but I had a, a solid two and a half months of work mm. when I made the jump, knowing that I could probably pick up work, give me enough time to, you know, to begin to build up, you know, fill up the calendar, I guess, as a comic. Yes. So, yeah. yes, that'd be my advice is, you know, make sure you're ready and don't, don't drop the day job until like the day before you're ready to do the new job. Yeah. Although sometimes life doesn't care if you're ready, like we got made redundant March last year and <laughs> yep. had my quietest month in, in history and went, wow, what am I going to do? And I don't know, lucky something, someone suggested a business coach and I just thought this is not the time to be forking out lots and lots of money to a business coach. But I just went, can I commit to this? You know, can I do this? Do, do I have it within me? Can I give it a go? Will I give it everything? And I just committed and it's risky, risky business. And, you know, probably, probably wouldn't be the, um, the general advice I would, would give masses of people. You know? <laughs> That's but, a, yeah. but the the risk paid off. But I think, <clears> you know, I think when you're doing something you love, like you said, when you're doing something you love, you're going to keep doing it. And like you said, those, those, those things that, you know, the wife leaves you because you're no longer a banker and, and, you know, the situation of the mother, that, those things do happen. But if, you know, at the end of the day, you look and you go, wow, I'm happier than when I was then living someone else's idea of my life. You know? Yes, exactly. And that's individuation. You're living somebody else's, idea of what you should be doing up to their expectations and anthony by the way had done that his entire life yeah. he'd gone along to get along yeah and keep everybody happy and it, then he realized well of all the everybody i know i'm the only one who's not happy wait a minute and it was a business coach he said look anthony you're qualified for that job the reason you're not getting it is because you don't that's not where you need to be mm. And that was that piece of advice right there is probably worth every penny he paid the guy because that cool. started the process of well, what I want to do. Yeah. Because I think Kyle, people need to be given permission. You know what I do on a plane sometimes if I'm sitting next to somebody on a long flight and they want to chat. Then I, I ask some leading questions, you know, what do you do and so forth. Uh, and oftentimes I'll say, so what do you do? Well, I would do so and so. And I say, you like it? And this is classic. They go, yeah, you don't have to be a psychologist to know yeah. that that's a wee bit qualified of an answer. Yeah. So I say to them, okay, um, if I could wave a magic wand and you could do anything you wanted and make a living and, and support yourself, what would it be? And man, they light up because they've got something in mind. Mm -hmm. But 
I often get the feeling that nobody's ever asked them that question. Nobody's ever pushed them to that point where they have to think. Mm. And so my favorite story is about this. I sat next to a woman. She set up exhibit halls for conventions. Yeah. Good business, good money. And um, I said, do you like it? Yeah. <laughs> what would you like to be doing? I can't even remember what she told me, but it was obviously a dream of hers, you know, on her bucket list. And I said to her, let me ask you this. If you quit the exhibit hall business tomorrow, does husband, husband make enough money? You guys survive? She goes, oh, yeah. We'd be, we'd be a little tight. We'd be fine. So a year later, I get an email. She goes, Frank, you probably don't remember me. I'm the woman sitting next to you on a plane. I oh, wow. set up exhibit halls for a living. And you asked me, what would I do if I could do anything I wanted to? And she goes, I'm doing it. <laughs> Oh, man. I think she'd never, she'd Give never, you a lot. nobody ever given her permission. Yeah, yeah, I gave her permission to give, you know, to give that thought serious consideration. And apparently, yeah, apparently she did. She quit the job. She's doing what she loves doing now. So that's, yes. that's what I think. Oftentimes a business coach can, it's not so much what they pour in, it's what they pull out. Yeah. Anthony, do you really want to be a banker? No, come to think of it, there's your answer. You need to get the hell out of the bank. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and what and I realized, like, yeah, well, what I realized, my business coach was the the follow up questions. You know, it was one question, then it was another question, then it was just those questions would dive deeper because sometimes you 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 just re, you just reply with something that's not true, but you you know at some level you think it's true in your head, and you just reply. And eventually asks again and again, and then you get to a certain point and you go, you kind of, the surface level has been shaken out and you get to the core mm -hmm. and you go, oh, actually, yeah. The reason why I've been getting my own way is because I really want to be doing this or, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Do I really want to be, you know, I asked an attorney one time at a Christmas party, I was entertaining it. We're having dinner and I said, you know, you like to be an attorney? Mm, yeah. <laughs> Well, if I could wave a magic wand, what would you do if you could do anything you wanted to? And I, I can't remember what he told me, but it was something entirely different. And he said, well, let me let me ask you, if you could wave a magic wand and do anything you wanted to do for a living, what would you do? And I said, man, I got bad news for you. I'm doing it. <laughs> 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 because, can I tell you why? When I first got in the insurance business, I went to a training in Seattle at the home office of the insurance company. And they had a guy named Ed Hall. I'll never forget him. And he did, um, for the first day or so, we did a, they had bought a motivational speaking thing that modules, and we did a motivational, you know, like for the first day and a half. And somewhere in that, Kyle, he said out loud, look, there's 40 of you. There's no way that all 40 of you guys belong in the insurance business. He said, the home office, don't tell the home office I told you this. But there's probably, out of 40, there'll probably be five years from now, four of you will still be in the insurance business. The rest of you will be doing something else. So yeah. let me let me do this for you right now. I'm going to give you permission to have that thought. Is insurance really for me? Or what would I really like to be doing? <laughs> and yeah. it was the first time anybody said I had a choice. And yeah. that was by... At that, at that initial training, Kyle, that was the beginning of the end of my insurance career. I just, I just <laughs> used insurance as a life support system for comedy until I was ready to ditch it. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're so right about that permission. You know, I think we're, we're told what to do our whole lives. And, you know, the natural way of a kid is to be curious, is to disobey, rebel a bit, you know, agitate things a bit to, to work out, you know, what they want to do, play, play with this toy a bit, play with that toy a bit you know, work out, figure out their life. And I think for, for the remainder of our life, we're told what to do for, you know, for so much of it, whether it's school, whether it's jobs, whether it's career. Um, and then it comes to that point where, you know, someone gives you permission. It could be on it, like you said, on a plane flight, you know, someone mm -hmm. who's not related to you, who's got no, no connection, you know, just gives you permission. Nope. You go, wow, you're the only person in my 50 years, in my however many years that's given me permission. I'm going to go and do what I want. Yeah. Yeah. Have permission to have that thought, see how it feels, and try that on. Yeah. And, you know, maybe, maybe you are in the right place. Maybe this is what you should be doing. Yeah. But you should at least ask the question so you don't look back at 64 and go, man, I wish I'd, I wish I'd done that open mic night, started comedy. 
I knew when I got on stage, I heard inside my head, you're home. Awesome. Um, and I've only heard that a couple of times in my life, you know, unbidden, just popped into my head, you're home. Yeah. Welcome home. Wow. So it's, yeah, it's that it clicked for me there. And then when I started doing the suicide prevention speaking and I made that my only speaking, I used to have a motivational speech, network speech, January 1st, 2018, I thought, you know what? I looked around at all the successful people in town, really successful. And I thought, what do they have in common? And it hit me. They all do one thing extremely well. Mm. No side hustles. And I thought, that's it. I'm going to be a suicide prevention speaker. That's my lane. I'm going to do that, you know, to the best of my ability. Yes. And it made all the difference. All of a sudden, things began to fall in place. People would contact me. I hear you do this. You know, people that I probably should have, that I was destined to meet if I chose to, if I got in line with my purpose and my passion, mm. all of a sudden the people and the opportunities begin to line up, it seems to me. Yes. And, you know, somebody called me the other day and said, listen, we'd like you to be on our board of directors of our new mental health nonprofit. And I said, are you sure you dial the right number? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a comedian. I got no work ethic. Are you sure you want me on the board? <laughs> he said yes he said yes we'd love to have you on the board like, okay fine so yeah so awesome. i wake up and i with my topic and what i do i go to bed thinking about it i wake up thinking about it i don't have to push to work at it you know what i mean i don't have to i don't have to, i don't have to drag myself out of bed for the work mm. sometimes i have to drag myself out of bed but it's not because i hate my job yeah. i love my job and that's a big thing to get in to get in the right position for your life you know, that's one big plus. Yeah. F- well, fine, figure out everything. What, yeah. Yeah. Figure out, you know, figure out what your destiny is. What if who you are is not really who you are? Yeah. What if it, with the destiny you're living is not really the destiny you're supposed to be living? Exactly. I love it. That's awesome. All right. We're going to finish on that because that's a, that's a impactful thing for the viewers to take away and, and consider and maybe contend with and maybe get ask get someone to ask them that question or maybe ask them that question themselves now we did we, we just did yeah to everybody exactly. who's listening yeah what makes you think you can be a i was watching this podcast and frank yeah. said yes yeah <laughs> exactly you're right we did it we did it now frank where can um some of the, my audience find more more about you so you've got the mental health and the tedx yep. yeah yeah your tedx coach.com and if you just type the mental health comedian into the search bar Yep. Even without the dot com, all my stuff comes up because I worked very hard to brand myself as the mental yeah. health comedian. And by the way, that's what I do for my one of the things I suggest to my speakers that I train. You don't want to be a commodity. You don't want to be just another speaker. Hmm. You want to be the thought leader expert. You want them when they're looking for a speaker on your topic, not just to be looking any speaker on your topic. They're looking for you. Yeah. Then you're no longer a commodity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So for, well, you know what that involves, Kyle? That involves figuring out who you are. Asking the questions. Yes. Yeah, so and there's a little work there, you know, it, make sure that, because uh, I think if it's your destiny, whatever it is you do, mm. the point will come where you'll no longer be a commodity. People will seek you out because, you know, you are the guy, you are the gal, you are that person that's obviously, you know, that's what you you are the expert, the thought leader. You obviously enjoy your work and that's the people I want to work with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Beautiful. Love it, mate. Awesome. Thanks for that. Thanks for sharing your wisdom and thanks for, you know, showing us how you've done it and, and what you, what you've had to contend with and, and the amazing work that you do to, you know, save lives every day. And as I did it by the way, as the comedians used to say before the ass crack of dawn, it's only <laughs> four o'clock in the morning over here. I know. God, mate. Look at you. Look, your hair's all smooth. Everything's on yeah, point. A little right. bit of tuft on top. <laughs> Beautiful. Thanks, mate. And thanks for getting up. I know the time difference is a, it's a big one. But um, yeah, I hope you have a beautiful day. And I will catch up with you, no doubt, in the future. And big thanks to... Well, yeah. And Kyle, just a note, because if they're watching this on video... Yeah. Um, there's obviously a time difference of I don't know how many hours. Uh, I think you're on the other side of the international dateline, so it's another day over there. Yes. But apparently, we're in the it's future. Close. It's closer to Christmas where you are, because there's a Christmas tree. In <laughs> <you>. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> exactly, yep. mate. Exactly. Yeah, we're in the future, so that's uh, that's that's you know. Oh, I see. Yeah, I just I'm looking at a Christmas tree, thinking, wait a minute, it's over here. It's like the tenth of <laughs> January. It's probably eleventh there. I know. Uh, I know. Why? But, why is there a tree? <laughs> a friend of mine keeps her tree up all year. Oh, takes the decorations down. So I guess maybe, maybe I've. Oh, there it is. Maybe I've got to take de decorations. Down. No. Yeah. No, you don't have to. No, you don't have to. We've got a tree out front, uh, beautiful fir, and it's it would be really pretty decorated with lights. And we're gonna we're gonna get Christmas lights and we're gonna leave them up all year long. Yeah. Yeah. You know why? Why? Why not? Why does it have? Yeah. Why does it have to be that one day? Why can't you? Yeah. Why can't it be sparkling every day? Yeah, because you know a lot of people have you know great feelings about the Christmas past, and you know, you see, I see those colored lights, and I have get a certain feeling, you know. And why not year round? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Another way to um, bring positivity in. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, Ebenezer Scrooge says, uh, you know, live every day like it's Christmas or something on that order. Yeah. So I agree with that. <laughs> I guess he kept Christmas in his heart every day of the year. That was it. Mm. So I figured, you know, why not put up the lights? Yeah, exactly. To remind you of Christmas. Yep. <laughs> awesome. All right, man. Thanks, Frank. Really appreciate it. And thank you for the viewers. And, and um, you know, I really appreciate you guys joining us. And I hope you got something, you took something away from this. And let us know in the comments. Um, like, subscribe, share. Let us know what you thought. If you have any stories, if you want to reach out to Frank, you know, you've got his um, mm -hmm. details there. I'll put some of his details in the bio. And if you want to re reach out to me, always happy for a chat. And yeah, thanks again. Cheers. Thanks, Kyle. Cheers. Thanks, mate.